Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. In my State of the State last week, I talked about the challenging housing shortage we face and our urgent need to make it faster, easier, and less expensive to build and rehab the units we need. This isn't new. We've been talking about it for a long time. And as you know, we've spent a half a billion dollars in the past few years to expand our housing stock. It's helping and having an impact, but not as much as it could. Based on the speed and cost we're currently building, it's clear we must address the other side of the equation if we're truly going to improve our housing stock. Right now, due in part to our antiquated regulatory system, it takes far too long and costs far too much to build. That means we're not getting the bang for the half a million bucks we put in sector and everyday Vermonters who are looking for small investment opportunities lack the incentives they need to further invest. This isn't a partisan issue and this isn't this perspective isn't a part of the problem. We hear from people from, of all political backgrounds about the needs to make it easier to build while upholding what's great about our state which is why I'm proud to stand here with you today with a tripartisan group of lawmakers who in partnership with my team have worked on packages that could really make a difference. Commissioner Farrell and members of the House and Senate will talk about the proposals in a few minutes. And we'll also hear from Wei Wei Wang, the Executive Director of the Vermont Professionals of Color Network, and Mike Del Treco, the President and CEO of the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Because housing, is about more than just housing. It's about community revitalization, workforce, affordability, equity, health, safety, and much, much more. This session, with the broad support you see today, I'm more confident than ever we can put politics aside and do what the vast majority of Vermonters know needs to get done to create and restore the housing we so desperately need right now. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Farrell. <clears throat> thank you, Governor. Um, so first, I want to thank Representatives Bartley, Hango, Sims, and Small for their leadership on this. I also want to thank the many other legislators and stakeholders, many of whom are in the room today, uh, for the work that they've done to contribute to the bill that we have today, H-719. Through this collaboration, we've developed a set of reforms that can be supported by folks in rural Vermont and urban areas, supported by employers as well as homeless advocates, and from folks across the entire political spectrum, as you can see here today. While I'm going to summarize some elements of the bill here today, we're going to be holding a webinar tomorrow from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., in which myself and some others will walk through some of the mechanics and details of the bill. In November, Governor Scott and I shared the administration's analysis of the current housing deficit, including where we're coming up short county by county. And it proved two things that we already knew to be true. One, that we need to reinvest in our regional economic centers. And second, that we need to drastically increase the number of homes in every corner of the state to give renters and home buyers more opportunities and more affordable options. This bill aims to achieve those two main priorities by realigning incentives to steer investment and revitalization of the ex existing housing stock into communities and neighborhoods that have been neglected, and encouraging the creation of new homes in the areas where we have the infrastructure to support it, and thus continuing to protect the green space outside of our compact settlement areas. To do this, the House's bill proposes the following. Firstly, changes to Act 250 jurisdiction to encourage more homes where we have the infrastructure and provide the incentives to grow while continuing to protect the green space outside of those areas. Secondly, appeals reform for housing development to make it easier to construct housing for all populations and income levels and to curb one of the biggest tools used to prevent fair housing creation in the state of Vermont. Third, adjustments to municipal zoning practices that currently inhibit unit generation. These reforms will focus on missing middle and infill development. Fourth adjustments to state and local permitting jurisdictions to allow for and encourage the conversion of hotels and motels into permanent housing units. And fifth, tax incentives to encourage the investment of blighted structures in neglected neighborhoods and communities 
with the aim of revitalizing our economic centers and bringing housing units to them. This will be achieved through targeted tax exemptions, largely for mom and pop uh, investors, and for the rehabilitation of blighted structures in the areas of greatest need. So while a number of programmatic investments are contemplated in this bill, the budget development is still underway and we can't get ahead of that process. But regardless, the regulatory reforms in this bill will make any investment, including the half a billion dollars we've already spent over the last few years, go much further than they have gone in our current system. This allows us to make better use of both public and private investment. Again, I'm grateful to this group of legislators. And um, for those that want to hear more in depth, um, we will be having our webinar again tomorrow uh, from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. to hear more details about the bill. You can find a link to that posted to accd.vermont.gov. And now I am uh, happy to hand it over to Senator Keisha Rahm Hinsdale. Thank you, Commissioner Farrell, and a uh, big thanks to Governor Scott as well. Um, I'm participating remotely today because I have COVID, so if you see me drink a bottle of small, a small bottle of brown liquid, um, it is elderberry syrup. I just want everyone <laughs> to know. Um, and I'll try to get through this as best I can. From where I sit, I can think of nothing more important to do right now than to set politics aside and tell Vermonters we hear them and we are working together to provide them with relief from the dual climate and housing crises we face. Today's proceedings come right on the heels of another major climate event last night. Even if there is not significant physical damage to be accounted for, we are hearing from every flood impacted individual and community that they experience a deep and growing fear every time it rains. We are hearing that any homeowner who takes a meager FEMA buyout for their destroyed home has to look out of state for something they can afford. We are hearing that renters are living in unsafe conditions but don't want their buildings condemned because they would have nowhere else to live. We are hearing about Vermonters battling mold, respiratory illness, faulty heating, depression, and untold financial and personal costs, and that they are hanging on by a single thread. We want you to hear from us that we are extending our hands and we will not let you go. We hear you and help is on the way. Our top priority is to ensure every Vermonter has choice, dignity, and safety where they live, where they build a family, and where they call home. Gratefully, because of the tripartisan work we did last session in the HOME Act, we are beginning to see modest growth and new housing units come online. It is now a climate imperative that we bring everyone home with our work this session. Bring Vermonters displaced by flooding back home, bring young people who want to come back to Vermont home, bring seniors who want to live near their families home. The Bringing Everyone Home Bill, or Be Home Bill, will incorporate the proposals discussed today, the good work of many housing and environmental stakeholders, and the best ideas from Vermonters reaching out to improve their neighborhoods and towns. Vermonters uh, can rest assured, we hope to vote the bill out of our committee by early February, as we know it will have a long way to go to passage, and we have much work to do to build support among our colleagues. To that end, while Act 250 has served us well for 50 years, I am looking forward to working with my colleagues to adapt Act 250 to meet the realities of the next 50 years. We need an Act 250 that gets communities out of flood paths and mudslide zones. We need an Act 250 that gives towns the tools to create a climate resilient vision for their communities and then lets them act with the speed and flexibility needed to achieve it. We need an Act 250 that creates a diverse set of first-generation homeowners and Main Street entrepreneurs to build the collective wealth of their communities. We must stop saying that this is the way it's always been and work toward the Vermont that must be. Inaction is simply not an option. Our economy will falter without the next generation having the economic foundation needed to join the workforce and forge Vermont's future to meet our other policy goals that build a brighter Vermont, from weatherizing homes to improving health outcomes to giving our kids a world-class education, we must recruit and retain the workers of the future. 
but people who want to remain here or move to our beautiful state are already turned away because of our lack of housing. Our rural communities and our cozy village centers that Vermont is known for are going to hollow out if we do not lead and act. So for those who have held on and cannot hold on any longer, help is on the way. We will build on the work of the Home Act with another major push for housing that puts politics aside to meet the very real needs of our neighbors. It is time to do the hard work that Vermonters have elected us to do. So together, let's bring everyone home. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rom Hinsdale. We all wish you a very speedy recovery. Let me first start by thanking not only my co-leads, but also all other members of the House of Representatives who have sponsored H719, committing to finding solutions for Vermont's housing crisis. Representative Sims, Small, and Hango, and I all recognize the need for a holistic solution to our housing crisis. After countless emails, phone calls, text exchange, and Zoom calls, H719 was drafted to be introduced on the floor later this afternoon. The overarching and primary objective of this legislation is to create more housing units and to reinvest in neglected neighborhoods, plainly stated, housing and community redevelopment. The bill addresses Act 250 in a way that promotes smart growth and revitalizes our communities in a substantial way for generations to come. For too long, the solution to the housing crisis has been siloed. The crisis impact spans across every facet of our community, transcending political affiliations and economic divides. Regardless of income level, be it lower, middle, or tied to generational wealth, each Vermonter has felt the weight of this crisis. I am incredibly proud of the collaborative work of my colleagues, making a good bill even better. While taking into consideration the needs of different communities, different constituent viewpoints, stakeholders, we have ensured that housing development can happen through Vermont, throughout Vermont, not just a minute portion of the state. Yet this bill goes beyond housing. Through the expansion and restoration of our housing, we can foster affordability for Vermont families, provide shelter for Vermonters who are experiencing homelessness, entice workers to fill vital positions in our workforce that is desperately needed, and offer, of course, necessary services to our communities. This concerted effort not only ensures housing stability and opportunities, but also plays a vital role in reducing crime, addressing substance abuse, and, and breathing new life into long neglected neighborhoods. H719 is just the beginning, and we have a long way to go. So, whether you're a representative, a senator, a stakeholder, or a community member, come grab your seat at the table. The time to act is now. Housing can no longer be just a goal. It must be made a reality for all Vermonters. And I am going to send, bring up Senator Sims. Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> so have, as others have already said today, and I think as we all know, we need more housing across the state and for families of all sizes, income levels, and service needs. I am so glad to be here together with the governor and all of the co-sponsors of this bill and our key partners to talk about the work that we're gonna do this session to address this issue. H719 builds on the great work that we did last year with the HOME Act. Working with a broad coalition, from developers to local officials, from environmental groups to human service organizations, we made historic housing investments to support new construction, to fix up vacant units, and to expand shelter capacity, while also making meaningful changes to our land use regulations. And those changes are already making a difference in my community. St. Johnsbury now has a long overdue warming shelter. Rental units are being brought back online in Hardwick, and the Sacred Heart property in Newport is scheduled for redevelopment. And yet, it has not been enough. We must continue to confront this challenge head on. This bill, H719, continues to make investments in the housing programs that we know are working, like the Vermont Housing Improvement Program, the Manufactured Home Repair Program, and the Missing Middle Homeownership Program. 
This bill also recognizes that we can't buy our way out of this housing deficit. We must continue to remove obstacles that have limited housing for decades by modernizing our land use regulations. Vermont's landmark Act 250 law has been instrumental in sustaining the Vermont we love, balancing the preservation of our unique landscape with the economic and development needs of our communities. I don't think any of us want to see more sprawl. We don't want houses in the middle of farm fields or huge single family homes on top of mountains. We also know that we haven't been building housing at the rate that we need to keep up with demand. And so if we want more housing in the right places, rehabbing existing buildings and building new infill development in our walkable downtowns and villages that are served by water and sewer, we need a balanced approach to land use regulation. While we protect some places, we also need to make it easier to develop in others. And this is exactly what this bill does. And as others have already mentioned, H17 has been a truly collaborative effort. And we know that the bill has a long way to go before it's across any finish line. But we are all standing here together to say to Vermonters, we hear you. We understand the magnitude of this crisis, and we are working together across geography, across sectors, across party lines to tackle this issue. And we invite you to be a part of that conversation so that together we can create healthy local housing markets for all of our communities. And now, from the kingdom to the news, <laughs> Representative <laughs> Taylor Smart. Beautiful transition. Good afternoon, everyone. As a member from Winooski, I truly understand the responsibility that I have representing the most densely populated and most diverse city in our state. And I highlight those two things to underscore the piece of how we as a city live into our values of being a welcoming state for our new American and refugee populations. And that our city has done everything that it can in its responsibility as leaders to build as much as possible to make sure that the folks who need the services of Winooski are able to attain them. And yet, year after year, our city leadership has asked for municipal delegation um, and to withdraw themselves from this duplicative process with the Act 250. And now, I finally see a path forward with this tripartisan effort to make that come to fruition. This legislation not only expands opportunities to build more units and development, but it does so in a way that protects our environment and protects our rental market. I have been so appreciative of the collaborative effort that has happened along the way, especially in understanding where we see the draw into our homelessness crisis. And we uh, put in and uh, said that we are going to protect tenants, making sure that they can be in units that are going to be safe and affordable, while also ensuring that they are not being pushed out of units just to make sure that they are able to get up to those standards. I'm grateful to the governor and his staff for bringing us into this conversation and uh, looking forward to providing pathways for both landlords and tenants uh, and building the Vermont that we are looking for. I will now pass it on to our colleague in the Senate, uh, Senator Randy Brock. Thank you, Representative Small. Uh, you've already heard uh, today that the time for action is now. Vermont's housing crisis is acute and we can't simply afford to nibble around the edges. In order to solve almost every problem we have, whether it be health care, costs, education, Vermont's tax burden, and more, we need to attract and retain more working Vermonters. And that will not be possible until we restore a healthy housing back balance and a housing market with more units and at reasonable prices. And the only way we can do that, as the governor mentioned, is to make it easier, faster, and cheaper to build the housing that we need. Last year, we made progress with regulatory reform with Act 100, into which my committee put substantial work. Even though those steps were welcomed, many of my colleagues and, our, and I argued that it wasn't enough and that more needed to be done. And that's why we're here today. Chair Ram Hinsdale and the rest of the Senate Economic Development Committee have committed to working with our counterparts in the House to focus on these very issues. Action can't wait, and bold regulatory reform is needed now more than ever. I'll now turn it over to Representative Hango. Thank you, Senator Brock. Good afternoon. 
As co-lead sponsor of this legislation, I want to thank my partners for putting together a package that has something for everyone. We put aside our political party ideology, and each of us brought something unique to the table. This bill makes strategic investments in our communities as we work to revitalize our landscape. Each ask was thoughtfully and respectfully considered, and we worked with what we all could agree on, rather than focusing on the deal breakers that would shatter this coalition. This legislation is a conversation starter. It touches on something that is important to each of our constituencies, permitting reform, emergency housing, creating new units, and providing opportunity for all Vermonters to have access to housing across all regions of our state. As it moves through the committee process, we welcome input from all stakeholders and know that it will be a better bill for the process. Thank you, Governor, and your administration, and Representatives Bartley, Sims, and Small for your perseverance, for your constituencies, and for your spirit of collaboration. I'll now turn this over to Wei Wei Wang, who is the Executive Director of the Vermont Professionals of Color Network. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Wei Wei Wong. I am the co-executive director for the Vermont Professionals of Color Network. We are a nonprofit, statewide nonprofit whose mission is to advance prosperity for black, indigenous, and people of color across the state. The issue of housing affects the fabrics, fabric of our beautiful state and shapes the very future of our diverse and growing community. Vermont faces challenges that demand our collective attention. Our state has the third oldest population, but also the second smallest population, and we are facing currently a shrinking workforce. Even if all working age Vermonters became gainfully employed, we would still have over 12,000 unfilled jobs. It's critical that we retain and attract the community here, um, that we have here and also from elsewhere, especially people of color. Vermont boasts one of the highest growths per capita when it comes to the community of color. In this state, the black, indigenous, and people of color community surged by an astonishing 112% between 2010 and 2020, not just in Chinning County. This community is a future workforce of the state. We also contribute over $1 billion in economic impact annually to the state. In fact, we recently dropped to third whitest state in the nation, so thank you, West Virginia, for taking on no number two. Um, while our racial demographics are shifting to the positive, wealth disparities in the community of color still exist. People of color are less likely to have generational and accumulated wealth, an asset that is critical in home ownership, which is critical in building wealth. Here in Vermont, only 20% of black home uh, households own a home compared to 72% of white households. Our housing challenges were steep even prior to the inflated home prices that began in late 20, 2020 and before the July floods, the December floods, and last night swept many residential structures away. So this information paints kind of, and what everyone has presented today, paints a pretty bleak picture for our state. And through the Vermont Professionals of Color, we are currently hearing stories from BIPOC community members. New residents relay the shock of arriving in the state and un being unable to find housing, speak speaking nothing of affordable housing. New college grads hoping to stay in the state where they have made tight community bonds, but having to move away to other opportunities because they can't find safe, affordable, and available rental units. A dual income household losing childcare after leaving Chinden County, moving outside of the county due to high home prices, forcing parents to leave their jobs. A C-suite executive living in a hotel for nine months while house hunting um, in Chinden County even, um, before settling on a rental unit that can't uh, accommodate his family to come from out of state. These are all BIPOC stories that we have heard over just the last 12 months, and that does not include the flooding period. Why does my organization care about this issue and these proposals? Because we are constantly being asked, help me find, how can I help find housing? Help me find housing. Because the BIPOC community, the people of color here, want to be in Vermont. They want to live in Vermont. And yet we are also being asked, how do we as the state, as businesses, as organizations, retain and attract BIPOC professionals and business owners to the state. 
Our housing crisis is at a critical juncture. It hinders other areas of growth, like workforce development, that the state really wants to accomplish. So a bold, comprehensive action is imperative. These proposals today here are the next step to ensuring that the community of color and really future generations of Vermont will be able to choose to stay in Vermont, to have safe shelter, to build lives and families in, and that can anchor them within the social and economic fabric of Vermont. Thank you, and I will turn it to Mike Del Treco, President and CEO of VAHSHS. <laughs> You got through my name. <laughs> um, so thank Governor Scott and members of the administration. It's an honor to be here. Um, when I heard about this bill, we jumped at the opportunity uh, to, to participate. As mentioned, my name is Mike Del Treco, and I serve as the president and CEO at the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. We represent all Vermont hospitals, and the great thing about our hospitals is they're all not for profit. Why is this so important to us? A safe, stable, healthy home is the foundation to an individual's health. It's key to the health of our communities that we serve. It's pivotal to building vibrant downtowns. And in the end, it's critically important to all Vermonters. You've heard a lot about that here today. Too, too many Vermonters lack the necessary home, not to mention one that is modern, safe, and healthy. This is particularly devastating for the most vulnerable, including those that are homeless, those living with chronic or complex health conditions, our children, and our elderly. This is why our hospitals are so supportive of this state's effort. To develop more housing of all types in every region is, is critically important. Our hospitals are amongst the largest employers in our community, and our staff, our nurses, and our doctors often find it problematic to find affordable housing. This impacts their ability to live here. It impacts our organization's ability to recruit doctors, nurses, and support staff that we greatly need to care for the communities we serve. Where possible, our hospitals have stepped up to invest in programs and services like housing initiatives because our communities desperately need them. However, it's no secret that our hospitals have been stretched for resources which are necessary to invest in their staff, their facilities, and equipment in their communities. As we build our budgets for the next year, we'll continue to look outside the hospital four walls in ways to support community needs like housing. This is way too big of an issue to ignore, and we must make progress. The fact is, if we get this right and invest in more affordable, safe homes, we'll see an improvement of the health of Vermonters. The simple reality is, housing is directly connected to health. As the state's healthcare leaders, we're committed to working with the administration, lawmakers, and the community leaders to address this issue. It's an honor for me to be here, and thank you so much for the opportunity. And I'll turn it back over to the governor. Well, thank you very much, and thank you to all the speakers uh, thus far and everyone who's participating today. We'll now open it up to questions. We'll stay on topic first, um, and then move on from there. Governor, how does this affect the, the sort of the classic divide of the last few years of we can build in downtowns, <clears throat> but we can't build hardly anywhere else. How, how would this change that? Well, I think, I believe, I'll let uh, Alex talk about this, but it expands uh, the area. It's not just in downtowns, it's in growth centers <clears throat> and uh, to provide more density. Yeah, <clears throat> sure. So. Uh, the, the Home Act took a lot of steps last year, including raising the Act 250 trigger within designated downtowns and villages from, from 10 units up to 25 units before Act 250 is triggered. Now, what this bill would do is create full exemption within all of those designated areas, downtowns, villages, neighborhood development areas, growth centers, and then even outside of those, where we have municipal water and wastewater and where we have zoning, it would raise the cap from 10 to 30, and thus making the best use of all of those assets uh, that, that we really have the capacity to build in. Anyone else want to add to that? Give us a wave, Senator, if you'd like us. <laughs> yeah, um, if, if I may, we, you know, we just heard the uh, the report of the Natural Resources Board on the tiering structure that they're proposing 
um, to create exemption from Act 250. And they are including any area that a municipality uh, would propose, provided that the municipality has sufficient water and sewer and zoning. So I hope that that extends to transit corridors, um, you know, to second clusters of development that many communities have, like Burlington or South Burlington. Um, you know, we need to see growth where we know Act 250 jurisdiction should end. Act 250 is about land use, and we've already determined that the land use in these areas is commercial, residential, or industrial, and therefore um, there shouldn't be duplicative processes that, uh, <clears throat> that developers and municipalities have to engage in to build housing. I just want to clarify. So this is, you mentioned 30 units. I know in the past it was 10 by 5 by 5 or, or whatever the, the ratio was. Is this just 30 units still with five-year period, five-mile radius, or 30 units flat out you can build whenever you'd like? So, uh, sure. So uh, full exemption within the designated areas and then outside of that where there's municipal water and wastewater and zoning, it would be 30 units. Uh, by two years and then removing that mileage requirement. And, and the thought there is, in a lot of ways, 1055 uh, mm -hmm. can encourage sprawl because you're being pushed <laughs> further and further out to avoid hitting that trigger. And this way it can allow for more units to be built per project and then more, uh, more densely uh, as you go on. Anyone else? I'm surprised to no one that many of our downtown village centers are prone to flooding. So I'm wondering how the authors of this bill are thinking about incentivizing growth and development in areas that are, are seeing future flooding. Well, again, expanding the area is going to help in that regard. It isn't just in the downtowns. There are areas in within the district, uh, the growth centers, where you can build safely in elevated areas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's right. So growth centers and neighborhood development areas are great opportunities for this. And the fact that we're not just restricting it to these uh, these uh, downtowns and villages gives a little bit more leeway to, to move out of those areas. So what, what is this? Oh. I'd also just mention that I think um, this bill complements other work that I know Senator Ron Pimsdale and other committees are looking at around flood resiliency and recovery. How are we also standing up access to capital so that communities can do really critical work to make our existing housing and future housing less vulnerable to future events? So we need to both address kind of regulatory reform about where we're encouraging development and also making sure that we're providing access to the capital needed to do that work um, that helps make our communities more resilient to events in the future. So, you know, all of these things are so intersectional. What does this bill propose regarding governance? What, what role do you see of the district commissions going forward versus the, the uh, Natural Resources Board? I know there's talk about professionalizing it or maybe expanding it. Just where does that conversation lie? Alex or Sabina? I, I can. And, and so what, um, what we're really trying to emphasize is this maintains the integrity of Act 250 such that it wouldn't change governance. There are other bills that are contemplating changes in governance structure and will allow those bills to, to contemplate what they will, and this does not negate that. This will only change where Act 250 is triggered. Anything else, Sabina? No, thank you. I'll go to the phones for on topics, but then we'll come back if you have off topics. We'll start with Chris Roy, and if you don't have an on topic, just let me know and we'll come back to you for the off topic portion. All right, we'll try Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Jason. I don't have a <clears throat> germane question on this. I can wait. All right, we'll come Thank back you. to you. Uh, Tom Davis, Compass for All. Right, we'll come back to you. Uh, Tom Davis, Compass for All. Try Keith, the Rotten Herald. Uh, nothing at this time, thank you. All right, we'll come back, uh, back to the room. Yeah, another. Um, there are some provisions in this bill around, you know, incentivizing the conversion of hotels and motels into affordable housing. I'm wondering, you know, it will take a long time for this regulatory reform to create units, and so I'm wondering how you're thinking about these interim solutions, particularly for 
you know, the thousands of homeless people we have in our state and if those will be losing shelter this spring through the Motel program. Well, everything's on the table uh, at this point in time. Uh, obviously, uh, we, our needs are great. Uh, they're immediate, they're urgent, and uh, so there's nothing we can do uh, that would, uh, that would uh, hurt anything of the long-term initiatives. So we are going to continue uh, to look for those opportunities to expand uh, shelter capacity and uh, homes, permanent homes for the homeless. Governor, the House today is set to vote on H-72, which will pilot to overdose prevention sites in the state. I'm wondering your current view of the Let's uh, come back to that, if we could. Uh, I'm not going to consider that on topic at this point. <laughs> well, we, we, may, we may be, so just want to give one last. I, I just had one follow-up to, to Carly's question, I guess, re regarding the general assistance program you know, come spring, uh, this funding will end. There's potentially thousands, or at least over a thousand people that will become unsheltered. I mean, what what is the plan, or what do you see going forward to avoid mass unsheltered yeah. homelessness? These we, are big, longer term scenario solutions. But what can we do in the interim? We there are many measures we can take, and we're working on them. Uh, Mr. Winters. Thank you. As the governor said, um, we are taking a, a number of measures to try to create shelters in the short term. But I think it's really important to remember that in the long term, a bill like this is one of the most effective things that we can do to address the problem that we're facing today. The scope could be much smaller if we had units. DCF is the, is the safety net. And we want to em emphasize the importance of this bill, this bill in front of us today, uh, to people experiencing homelessness. It might seem obvious, but it's really worth repeating that there's a direct correlation between the availability and the affordability of housing and the number of people who are unhoused. So if you look at the states with the lowest vacancy rates and the higher cost of rent, there's a direct correlation to the number of homeless they have in that state. So I'd really, I'd really implore everybody to support this bill as one of many ways to address the, the, the problem of homelessness that we're facing in Vermont today. Governor, what arguments would you use to get buy-in from the House and Senate Natural Resources Committees that have been somewhat intransigent against uh, rural housing development? Well, I, I believe uh, that having this broad coalition of um, House and Senate members uh, goes a long ways towards seeing change. So uh, I don't know what the perspective is of the Senate or House Natural Resources are on this bill in particular, um, but I do know there's a broad coalition of uh, members of the legislature that do see the issue and want to see change. Thank you. Can I add something? Sure. So, um, you know, I think what's, what's complimentary in the Senate is, is outside of session. I actually teach environmental policy at the law school, and Senator Bray, who chairs the Natural Resources Committee, is a home builder. Um, you know, so we have been able to find some common ground in the past, and we're going to have to work harder this year. But what I would say to those committees and to the environmental community is that we can't believe in climate change without believing in support for climate refugees. And I think we often think about climate refugees coming from other states and other countries and us needing to open our arms to them. But what we have right now are climate refugees that are our own neighbors. They are people who want to stay in Vermont uh, and simply cannot find another place to live. They want to stay near their existing community. So if it wasn't apparent from last year, once we've gone through all of this flood activity and we know it's coming fast and more frequently, um, you know, we have to understand that we have an obligation to climate refugees within our states. They're Vermonters and they're our neighbors. I think that's a great point, uh, Senator. And we have legislators that have experienced flooding themselves and had to make the tough decisions to move elsewhere. Any other on topic? This is the cue. <laughs> Unless you want to stay and answer some more questions.
gold star All right. Oh, <laughs> Just, just because I can't remember exactly which I know what it was about, but the uh, ace of me to the overdose prevention site, the pilot to sites in the state that also said they did Have you read the bill? I've, yeah. I've seen, yes, I've okay. seen portions of it, yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it's going to look like when it comes to the right. Senate or House floor, or eventually past the House, um, but. Um, my position hasn't changed on the injection sites, and I have communicated that with House and Senate leadership, um, so there's no surprise, but it's just a bridge too far for me. What do you mean by that? It's just that from, from my standpoint, I just don't think um, a government entity uh, should be in the business of, of enabling those who are addicted uh, to these drugs that are illegal, and I just, it's just counterintuitive to me, and I have a great deal of sympathy uh, and uh, empathy for those who are addicted, and I think there are other ways we can counteract that, and we have, we have measures in place, um, to, the treatment and recovery, um, prevention and enforcement, uh, those four legs of the stool I talk about a lot. Uh, that we need to, to double down on. And uh, if we want to build hubs, expand hubs uh, to provide some of the, the harm reduction, uh, that's fine. But the, the portion where we allow the safe injection of illegal substances is just, just too, too far for me to go. What do you make of the argument that what, um, what we're doing, not just in Vermont, but across the country, the opioid epidemic is nationwide, just simply isn't working right now, and that we should try something new and novel that hasn't been done before just to do anything different. Yeah, the, the, the drugs obviously have changed from opioids. When Governor Shumlin uh, gave that his remarks in the state of the state a um, number of years ago, um, it was a different, if it was a different opioid uh, at that point, and now we have fentanyl, um, and we have other substances uh, that are highly, highly addictive, and uh, and are, are different than what we were dealing with before. So we have to, to we, we have to adapt to that. But I still don't believe uh, that allowing for the safe injection uh, is the is a way to counter that. Judiciary Committee in the House, uh, they've been tackling retail theft, also potentially more resources for the judiciary to, to expedite justice, I think is how they've, they've framed it. Um, Your Public Safety Commissioner uh, this morning told them that public safety and, and accountability uh, is, is a piece of the puzzle that, that she sees that's missing. I mean, what, what's your assessment of, of you know, where the legislature is in the public safety conversation right now, and what else specifically would, would you like to see? Well, again, I'm encouraged, and whatever our uh, public safety commissioner had testified on, that is us. Uh, and so she was speaking for the administration at that point. And we, um, as I said, my state of the state, uh, we have to be honest about what we've done in the past, and, and if it's not working, we should reflect and do something different. And, and again, I, I was part of that. I signed some legislation that I'm not sure um, was the right approach now. Uh, so we just have to be honest with ourselves and, uh, and put into place measures that we think will keep the public safe. And, and I, again, I, I am encouraged to have uh, the Judiciary Committees taking this up. And we'll hopefully get to a point where, like we are with, with housing, uh, where we can come up with common sense solutions that protect the public. In your perspective, what does that look like? Mail reform, conditions of release? Yeah, all the above. Yeah, there's no one single element uh, that uh, uh, that I'm looking at. It's it's the accountability. It's it's about some of the measures that we put into place over the last few years that aren't working, uh, and so we just need to reflect on that and, and come up with something that will work. So last year, the Senate passed through S18, which is a bill that would ban all types of flavored tobacco, flavored vapes, things of those nature, and 
House Human Services had picked it up, had a testimony from Dr. Lewin this morning or tomorrow throughout the week. Just wondering what your thoughts would be on that. Yeah, again, I, uh, <clears throat> I don't, I don't appreciate smoking myself. I think it is a tremendous health risk and something that we can, we can counter in many, many different ways. I'm not sure um, that the that the flavored uh, tobacco products are going to be the solution either. Uh, I'm not sure that that is what gets people uh, addicted to, to tobacco. But um, but again, if it's if it's something the legislature. Uh, moves and, and puts on my desk, and it was, um, and it's within the parameters of what we're thinking. Uh, I would probably sign it, uh, but it's not something that I think is we should spend a tremendous amount of time on. I think there are other issues that I'm much more concerned about, uh, like uh, edibles uh, in terms of cannabis, and that's that's something that's real. It's growing. It's building, and I'm very concerned about that. Can you confirm that six troopers at the St. Johnsbury Barracks were placed on administrative leave and are facing an internal investigation? I am aware of that, uh, but I would probably refer to the commissioner on, on the details, but it is an, an internal investigation. Can you say anything about what the... the I, I, I don't know exactly what it is, um, but, uh, but I know uh, that they saw an issue and uh, they decided to put them on leave and, uh, and investigate it. to include coercive and controlling behavior. The intent is supposed to be to help uh, victims separate from their partners before it turns physically abusive. Uh, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I haven't, um, I'm not aware of exactly what that does, mm -hmm. um, but here's what I do know. Uh, I, domestic uh, violence, uh, domestic abuse is rising, and uh, we need to find ways to counter that as well, and that's disturbing. So. I will, um, I will get with my team and if it moves forward, uh, take a look and see whether we can support it or not. And maybe we are, um, but I haven't, I haven't spoken to our Department of Public Safety or my general counsel on this. I know in the House Judiciary, some of the no votes were attributed to a concern over adding another level of burden to the judiciary system in Vermont, which is already overburdened. How do you make that argument? Again, I know the judiciary system is compromised, challenged at this point in time, but um, at the same time, uh, it's hard to, to utilize that as a reason to not provide for the safety of those situations. Lawmaker compensation is back on the table. Um, it's a little watered down from, from last year's. It doesn't have the health care benefits. Um, have, you, have you seen the proposal? I know you were I have proposing. not. My, my feelings haven't changed on that either, but I have not seen the new bill. There's also actually separate from the bill specific to legislator compensation. There is one bill, I believe, introduced by Senator Kosky, which would reduce your salary and those of your administrators to the level of pay that legislators get. We'll see where that bill goes, and and if I, they decide they have the supermajority, if they decide to pass that, um, and they have the power to do so, we'll we'll live with it. What do you make of the principle? Um, it sounds like retribution, uh, in, in you know my opposition to their pay raise. Yeah, a couple, of, um, yeah, a few days into the session, but um, you know the second year of the. By any of it's really when things really start moving. I mean, how, how would you describe the relationship, you know, this this session so far with the, the supermajority and, and with the legislative leaders? Um, it's I think it's cordial. Um, I I treat everyone with respect and civility. Uh, we have our differences. We may not all agree on every issue, um, but uh, but again, I respect their work and uh, and again seeing all the, the legislators who are on board with this housing initiative uh, gives me great hope. 
We'll go to the phones. I think there were a couple off topics there. We'll start with Tim McQuiston from Vermont Business Magazine. Tim from Vermont Business Magazine. Governor, I was wondering about where the money is going to come from for the JP settlement. Uh, you have to pay that, I suppose. And um, did, did it just come out of the general fund, or you have to set up a, even a new bill for that? Um, we believe. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that's in the. I'm pretty sure that's in the can you? You fix that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's uh, in the BAA, and uh, it's uh, something the Attorney General. The Attorney General. Uh, is, wait, Tim, we're, getting, uh, we're getting feedback from you. So when, when you're uh, listening, you're, you're uh, we'll do. So the, the, the follow up I had, Governor, was um, it's a big number. Why not uh, take AIG to court to try and get them to, to pay what would seem to be their obligation? Um, I think that's a better question for the Attorney General, uh, but uh, from my standpoint, uh, I'm not sure they would be successful. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you, Governor. Keith? Uh, not at this time, thank you. Tom? And no Chris? Thank you all very much.